Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear students, uh, we are today uh, gathered here to have a tremendous program around witnesses of humanity. Let me start by saying that Professor Arnold, Arnold Toynbee concludes that societies and civilizations develop under the guidance of a very small group of leaders. He observes that when a society deteriorates and it seems that it is beyond any hope of reform, God chooses to send his wise gerent, who in behavior and conduct displays his qualities and virtues. It appears to human eye as if God himself had descended on earth in the garb of men to redeem humanity from the darkness and chaos. Hussein, Professor Toynbee writes, is one of those vicegerents of God sent to dispel ignorance and to reform society of that time in history. Thus the message of Imam Hussein at, at place called Karbala is the message of humanity, peace, and justice. Imam Hussein's revolution was aimed at saving the people from corruption, humiliation, mortification, and ignorance. Let me mention a quote by Imam Ali, Ibn Ali Talib, who was the father of Imam Hussein and the cousin of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, a person is either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. I think this says it all. And this is the basis of the Karbala Center for Humanity. Our aim is to have an institution for transformative thought leadership to combine a thorough understanding and scholarly research in the literary, linguistics, and intellectual traditions preserving humanity and dignity of all. The center encourages inter and interfaith dialogue as it shall stand to uphold the fundamental equality and inherent dignity of all human beings. Our objective is to append and propagate climate of mutual understanding and respect. As such, create a positive atmosphere and reject the climate of fear that has been substantially shaped by the rhetoric of bigotry through education, dissemination of information, and knowledge transfer through open dialogue. With this partnership with UTD, we appreciate the wisdom and intellectual direction of, of UTD. In particular, while we thank all the panelists, I definitely want to thank Dr. Dean Romer, Holy Miori, and Chris Patti for continued support, encouragement, and friendship. I also thank all the panelists, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Amir Abbas, Dr. Mark Harlan, Dr. Ali Ali Boy, Beverly Hill, Dr. Valji, and of course, I've already thanked Dr. Romer for his support. And we are looking forward to enhancing this relationship, leading to, inshallah, establishment of Karbala Center for Humanity. With this, Dr. Romer, I would like to hand it to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. I think it was only befitting to hand over to our guests and hosts the opening of tonight's discussion. So thank you, um, Osif. It's now my pleasure to welcome and introduce you um, to UT Dallas. I'm the interim dean of the School of the Arts and Humanities, but I also welcome you tonight as the director of the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies. For us, in many ways, the idea of a witness harkens back to an effort in the 1990s to record the last surviving uh, members of the Holocaust and their respective testimonies. And ever since, I think the idea of a witness has become more and more important. Today, the very effort that had begun in the 1990s has turned into a, actually a far more comprehensive attempt to chronicle not only the surviving voices of Holocaust uh, victims, but also that of many other genocides. So today, if you were to visit the uh, USC Shoah Foundation, there are records of the Armenian Genocide, of Rwanda, of Guatemala, and so on and so forth. And the new platform is kind of tantalizingly titled Eyewitness as a way of engaging now ever greater audiences. So it's in that spirit that we wanted to follow up today with a kind of multiple perspective view on what witnessing means today for us 
Um, coming from various perspectives, that's why there are so many of them and there's only one of me, um, because we want to like really open this up a little wider and think about what are the various commonalities of the ideas of a witness and how much is maybe the idea of a witness also still tied to religious traditions. It is, in the end, the idea of a martyr that quite literally means witness, and in various traditions, the word martyr referred more often actually to the witness. And so I think, therefore, there's also something for us to investigate as we're talking about the witnesses to humanities, about the commonality of witnessing themselves and its great importance uh, for today. So that's one of the venues that we're going to pursue. The other one, quite literally, is um, to also engage in a conversation amongst ourselves. And so therefore, our various panelists they're not going to like me after tonight's event. They all individually get three minutes. <laughs> you know why I'm not popular, right? And three minutes. Then after each one of them had their chance, they'll be in a conversation with each other for about 20 minutes to half an hour where they can kind of follow up upon the things that they said. And then thereafter, we'll open it up to the public, okay? And everyone else can also have a chance and ask some questions. I'm cho going to choose the order pretty much at random because there's no particular way in which we want to order this. Um, there's no kind of grouping of religious traditions versus secular, but I think hopefully um, this will keep uh, you know, the discussion open and a um, little bit more interesting. So I call, therefore, as our very first speaker today, Dr. Syed Abbas, um, to um, speak from where, you can speak from where you are, Syed Abbas is a public lecturer, teacher, and family counselor. He's currently working as a director of the Religious Harmony and Theology and Kabbalah Center, of which we already heard, the Center for Humanities. So he was already trying to haggle with me, three minutes, 3.30, so my eyes are on you. You're the first one. Thank you. Take this one. Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of someone who is ultimate reality and final cause. He is someone who is known as Allah by Muslim, God by Christian, Yahuwah by Jews, Ishwar by Hindus, and ultimate reality by Buddhist, and nature by atheist. Really, it is not difficult, but impossible to talk about the topic in three months, in three minutes. Witness, witnesses of humanity. What does it mean, witness? And what does it mean when we are saying humanity? Because human being is the most unknown being in the universe, according to the Dr. Alexis Carroll. Man, the unknown. But luckily for Hussein, the greatest martyr and the witness of the humanity. There are so many words. I am seeking the help from one of the great poet, and he is Josh Mali Abadi. He said, let the mankind awake from the slumberness of ignorance. Every individual and every nation will assert we belong to Hussein. You know, today is 27th of October. What is the relevance of this 27th of October to Hussein? 680 century, at that time when the Karbala, the incident of Karbala occurred, at that time the date was 10th of October 680. What happened in the Karbala? In Karbala, Hussein told what is the significance of humanity. Hussein told human beings are equal. And in the camp of Imam Hussein al Islam, there were not only the Muslim, there was also Christian, there were Hindu. We have now in India Husseini Brahman. Hussein al Islam told what is the meaning of equality, justice. And all the people in the world, they are bowing their respect to Hussein al -Islam. why? Because Hussein gave the sacrifices not for the Muslim, for the universal ethical and moral values. 
that are appreciable, admirable, and respectful for all the humanity. Hussein was not fighting with some people who were opposing Hussein religion, Hussein's religion. Hussein didn't fight with non-Muslim. Hussein fought with someone who was saying that we are Muslim, but they were persecuting the humanity. They were beheading the humanity. They were plundering the masses. Hussein told them, if there are some people who are saying that we are Muslim, but they are not showing their humanity, their humbleness, their dignity, their justice, they are not only not Muslim, even they are not the human being even. Hussein alayhi salam at that time told the people, see, if you are going to take this thing, criterion of superiority in the human society, that is called the power, the wealth, the government, the number of their tribe, this is not the criterion, this is not the true and genuine criterion of the superiority. What is the criterion of superiority? Your good deeds, your good intentions, your humanity. Hussein alayhi salam told the people, after me there would be only two camps. One, the people who believe in Husseiniyat and Husseini Mokaf and Husseini school of thought, and the other who are not believing in the Husseini school of thought. Now you are seeing a lot of persecution in the world. Now you are seeing there are people who are saying we are Muslim. They are killing the people. They are persecuting the people. These are the people who were opposing Hussein at that time. And now the people of Daesh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, all these people, they are followers of the killer of Hussein, alayhi salam, who was Yazid, and all those people. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was the shortest three minutes ever. <clears throat> all right. Thank you. That brings us to our next speaker, which is Mark Holland. He's an author, oh, here we go, an educator and specialist in the field of Muslim-Christian relationships, and he's the chair of the Abraham Center at Dallas International University. And he has his own mic. Okay, if you can hear me. Assalamu alaikum, shalom alaikum, and peace be upon you. I'm at the Abraham Center at Dallas International University, where we uh, teach about the uh, religions of the uh, Father Abraham. And we have a unique program, the only MA in Abrahamic Studies in the United States, as well as some other programs. Um, I want to talk this evening about the first witness or martyr in human history. He's known to Jews, Muslims, and Christians uh, by the name of Abel or Habil. And so I'd like to, to tell you the story. It's in the Torah. Uh, the Muslims call it the Torah. Christians refer to it as the Pentateuch, with the five books of Moses. And this story is in the very first book. And it goes like this. Now Adam made love to his wife, and she be Eve, and she became pregnant. And she gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel... Worked the so, uh, kept flocks, but Cain worked the fields. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. And the Lord looked with favor upon Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to him, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? 
Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to drink your brother's blood from your hand. Now when you work the soil, it will no longer yield its crops for you, but you will become a restless wanderer on the earth. And it happened just that way. And that's the story of the first human martyr. Swiftly moving on, um, it's my, my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ali Alibai. He's one of our visiting assistant professors here at the University of Texas at Dallas. And uh, your PowerPoint is just underneath this one. Just get out of here to this. Okay, this doesn't count for his three minutes. He has three minutes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, clip this up. Oh, that'll be better. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Romer. Um, thank you, Mr. Effendi, for inviting us here tonight. Thank you, Dean Romer, for organizing this program. And Holly Mori, thank you so much. Um, since I only have three minutes, I'll, I'll speed up. Um, as a medieval historian of visual culture and religion, I cannot express how many cultures and religions around the world, as we've just heard, have conceived rituals, doctrine, and architectural constructions to honor their predecessors and forefathers who sacrificed themselves for the betterment of mankind. In medieval Islamic religious thought, those who sacrificed themselves for the greater good, for the preservation of faith, for the betterment of humanity, are considered the most honorable souls, worthy of the most splendid rewards in heaven. This group of righteous people are known specifically as shohada in Arabic, similar to martyrs in Greek, both words derived from the meaning of bearing witness as Dean Romer pointed out in the beginning. The idea of bearing witness is tied to professing one's faith or one's beliefs, one's goodness, even in the face of tyranny, even if it means one might put themselves in peril. Islamic thought extends this idea of martyrdom past the battlefield. Simply put, in Islamic thought, to be a martyr, to stand up for what is right and just, no matter what the cost might be, is the idea of a bearing witness. Um, so, um, as uh, we have heard again and again, Imam Hussein, uh, the grandson of the Prophet, uh, gave his life and he sacrificed his life uh, for the betterment of humanity. We heard that in uh, some of the earlier talks, so I won't repeat it. One thing that we don't talk about is that the visitation of Hussein's shrine in Karbala is actually one of the largest pilgrimages that occur in the world. We think about Islamic pilgrimage as just the Hajj, but yearly actually 14 million people visit Iraq every year in the 40 days between the 10th of Muharram and, 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 and 40 days later to commemorate this martyrdom. So there's something inside um, whether or not which denomination of Islam you follow, there is a honor to, of, uh, towards sacrifice, to remembering martyrdom, to, to bearing witness. And that is shared not only by Muslims, but of all cultures alike. And this is why we're here tonight to talk about that. I wanted to join the conversation tonight from my own unique perspective, uh, which is to talk about an unlikely witness to the legacy of, of sacrifice. One of the subjects I teach at UT Dallas is Islamic art and architecture. And to that respect, um, I want to talk about a hadith of the prophet. Uh, that hadith says, um, it talks about the souls of martyrs, that when uh, martyrs basically die, their spirits are sort of um, remain in the crops of green birds. The prophet said this, and he says that the crops means um, uh, an anatomically, and uh, birds have this pouch which keeps seeds in it before they di before they digest it. So these green birds fly to heaven, and they they fly over the rivers, and and they. Um, uh, they, um, they, they, they land on the, the chandeliers that are hanging near the throne of God. Now, this vivid imagery is, is so unique. It's, we don't have this much vivid imagery, but it's, it's these green birds that have mesmerized me to sort of dig further, to try to understand 
why would this, would this imagery have green birds in it? Now, the word for green in Arabic is khudr. Um, and that's an interesting word because uh, green actually, uh, in, in the early Islamic period, is used for green seats like these, but also the sky is also called green. So blue and green kind of get mixed up. So are these birds green birds? Or do they actually exist? Are they mythical? Um, I kind of went back, and I'll, and I'll finish in 30 seconds, I promise, um, uh, to kind of look at, uh, at, at uh, mentions. Were there any mentions of green birds in the medieval Islamic period? I found a book that, that was written in the 9th century uh, called Kitab Na'at al-Hayawan, which is basically the book of the characteristics of animals. It was written by a Christian physician in the 9th century Abbasid court named Ibn Bakhtishu. Um, the source is basically from Aristotle and ba Ibn Bakhtishu combined. Um, the book has entries of all types of animals. You can see rabbits, you can see the unicorn, you can see the elephant and the rabbit. Uh, uh, but it, in this book, um, and this is where I'm going to end my talk, is that we, uh, looking at this, 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 this soul of the martyrs, I found that it does mention a species of green birds. So now I'm going to either look further to see if these green birds are actually a species that belong in the region of, of the Middle East or were they a mythical creature. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that altogether, if you think about this 9th century court, it's a Christian physician, Ibn Bakhtishu, who came from Iran to a Baghdad, to a learning center. And they, they, they encompassed all the greatest people to, to, to witness humanity. To, and, and in many ways, we can all become like these green birds to honor the sacrifices of our predecessors by becoming green birds of our own and working together, regardless of our faith, regardless of our past, regardless of our uh, perspectives, and come together and join together and witness humanity and be green birds of our own. So thank you very much. Mm. All right, that brings us to our next speaker, Beverly M. Hill, if you want to come up. Let me just uh, do the switch of the pictures here. As they say, you are on here. Slide show. There we go from the beginning. All right. Um, Beverly Hill founded the Gendercide Awareness Project in 2011 to combat gendercide. And she's, she's working on that project ever since and uses nowadays her scholarly as well as her, her artistic skills to raise public awareness about this phenomenon. So we're very pleased to have her here. Now she gets a microphone and her three minutes. Thank you very much, Dean Romer. And thank you, uh, Mr. Effendi, for establishing this lecture series. Many of you are unfamiliar with the term gender side. Uh, it's the, more correctly called female genocide. And it refers to the elimination of females around the world from very young to very old due to social causes. When we say social causes, we mean severe discrimination, lack of basic human rights, and oppression, so severe that it makes a measurable dent in the human population. To be clear, when we're talking about gender side, we're always talking about female deaths in excess of male deaths for men and women living in the same country and falling in the same age bracket. At present, we're losing 3.2 million women and girls each year. Again, those are excess female deaths. So what's happening? How are we losing them? Uh, the largest contributor to this loss of life is sex-selective abortion. That's the selective abortion of female fetuses, not male fetuses, in countries where there is a strong preference for sons over daughters. We're losing 1.2 million females from the world each year due to this. And again, that's not the total number of female fetuses aborted, that's the number in excess of male fetuses. The next contributor is something you never hear about in the news, but it's the perishing of older women over age 50 who simply cannot access food, shelter, and medical care 
as successfully as men can. And so there are a million of them each year who don't live out to their life expectancies. After that, we have the lethal neglect of very young girls, generally in the same countries where there's a strong preference for sons over daughters. These girls weren't wanted in the first place, so they are not given, they're not nursed as much, they're not given as much nutrition, they're not immunized, they're not taken to the doctor when they get sick, they're not given antibiotics. They're allowed, if not encouraged, to die. And we have excess female child mortality, that's the name for it, of 400,000 400, per year. And lastly, we have uh, maternal death that is 99% preventable at very low cost. There's no excuse for it, uh, especially in countries that have nuclear programs and yet have very high rates of maternal death, Pakistan and India being two of them. Uh, there's, it's, there's just no excuse for it. It could easily be eliminated. I didn't mention, or I didn't put on the slide, but I'll mention femicide, that's the act of murder of women. Numerically, less significant, it's about 100,000 per year. That includes intimate partner violence, which is universal. Uh, and then other forms of killing, which are more regional, uh, dowry murders, honor killings, gang killings, uh, and in the United States, we have murdered and missing indigenous women, for example. Uh, so there you can see the percentage that each of those contributes. 3.2 million women per year lost means we're losing six uh, women per minute. And that leads us to ask, what is the cumulative loss altogether over time? Uh, demographers put that at 143 million missing women and girls, and of course missing is a, a euphemism, they're dead. It's a large number, so let's do some comparisons to put it in context. Uh, 143 million is 43% of the United States population. We can also compare with atrocities. Uh, you see how many we lost in World War I, World War II, uh, in the loss of indigenous people in the Americas is put, like the high range is 100 million. Gendercide is the largest atrocity the world has seen and virtually no one knows about it. Uh, it is a strong and compelling argument for moving to women's equality. Last way to understand this is to express 143 million as a percentage of the world's female population. So understood that way, 3.7% of the world's female population has been eliminated. Uh, there are countries in, in the world where 9, 10% of the female population is gone. So, how do we help? Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, we believe that educating girls is the best long-term strategy, and our organization does that. We fund the education of girls in six countries. Um, these are girls who otherwise would never, ever get an education. They're too poor for that. Uh, there are some photographs. A World Bank study shows that with just a fifth grade education, a girl will marry later, have fewer children, be less likely to get HIV or AIDS, and enjoy the other benefits in that study uh, that, that are um, listed there. We also raise awareness by every means possible. Uh, together with some of the people here in this room from South Asia Democracy and with UT Dallas, we hosted Amartya Sen, the Nobel Laureate, to speak here in 2015. He is the man who first figured out that gendercide was occurring, that the discrimination was so severe that it made a measurable dent in the, in the population. And we have an art exhibit that uses baby booties. Each pair represents 10,000 missing women and girls arranged in a floor-to-ceiling labyrinth. It would 
Uh, it's larger than this auditorium, uh, maybe 50% again larger. Uh, and it works because we get the media to come and we get the issue in the news. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Hasnain Waji, who's an educator, historian, filmmaker, and author who has penned 26 books on nutrition and natural medicine. That's why I'm sitting right next to him. There's lots of things that one can learn here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Thank you, Dr. Romer. Thank you, Asif, for the opportunity. Thank you, UT Dallas, for the forum. And thank you, all the speakers before me. And thank you, Dr. Romer, for keeping us exactly on time. But since mm. I've come all the way from Dallas, can I have an extra minute? <laughs> OK. Um, witnesses. Now, we're talking about witnesses. So if you guys are very comfortable, I apologize, because I am going to move you into a discomfort zone. Because that's re really the whole idea of this session. Witness has two connotations. Witness is a verb, and witness is also a noun, a witness. Not long ago, we saw an African-American man, George Floyd, who had his life being drawn away. We watched that on our screens. We were witnessing what our society has to write and what our society has to correct. We were witnesses to that. That was a witness as a verb. We are witnessing an atrocity. Beverly just talked about the genocide and the project. People witness what happens to the world. Witness as a verb is not going to cut it for us. And that's where we need to move from our comfort zone into doing something about it so that I become a witness. Just as Hussein was a witness, just as Joan of Arc was a witness, and the many, I don't have time to go through the list of the martyrs to humanity who all became witnesses that they became that moral standing, and when they saw that the moral compass of humanity was going at a tangent, they brought us back. This is a witness. And for each one of us, we need to be not just witnessing events, but truly become witnesses, or a witness, so that I do something about it, that I as an individual can do much. And this truly is the message of all the martyrs. Hussein ibn Ali, the grandson of the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, said three words which changed the entire ethos of humanity and martyrdom. He said in Arabic, mithli, La yubahihu mislo. Meaning, he did not say when he stopped, when he stood against the tyrant Yazid in those days, he did not say that I am not going to bow down, I am not going to pay allegiance to this man. What he said was that the likes of me cannot pay allegiance to the likes of him. He was universalizing that message of humanity saying if there is evil being done, then I as a human being have a responsibility to stand up to that 
And that is the meaning of becoming and being a witness rather than merely witnessing what we, what we observe because we've got so used to this. Yes, internally we feel when we saw that life being taken away on our screens and social media is a double-edged sword, as Facebook will tell you. But we saw this. Social media allowed us to this, to end. I know that my extra minute may also expire very soon. <laughs> For us who are gathered here today, there is need to memorialize. We must become witnesses to the witnesses. And how do we become witnesses to the witnesses is that we create, just as the memorials have been created for Holocaust, the work that is being done, that for all the martyrs, from whatever faith they may be, the martyrs of humanity deserve to be remembered, deserve to be memorialized. And that truly is the ethos with which the Karbala Center of Humanity has been envisioned. And I appreciate and applaud UT Dallas for having taken up this so very important step because the diversity that we have in our country requires that every matter of every faith, of every persuasion is memorialized forever and ever. And hopefully the Karbala Center of Humanity will become a pace setter, a trend setter for something like this. Thank you for listening to me so patiently. He knows by now that he's up by deduction. He has concluded that it's his turn. Professor Patterson, our Hillel Feinberg Chair, Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies, and my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm going to say just a couple of words about what witness testimony uh, might mean in the Jewish teachings and tradition. And whenever I want to you know, find out what that is. I ask, well, what is the Jewish teaching here? I always look to the holy tongue, uh, the language of Torah, which is Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew is the holy tongue, not because the Torah is written in Hebrew, but rather the Torah is written in Hebrew because it is the holy tongue. The word for witness, eda, one of the words, eda, uh, first of all, also means community. One of the cognates, ya'ad, means mission, having a sense of mission or meaning. Another cognate, ye'ud, means destiny. And uh, if you know your Bible, you know about the tent of meeting or the tent of testimony, the tent of encounter that the Israelites carried through the desert, the ohel mo'ed. A mo'ed is also a cognate of eda, which is encounter uh, meeting, coming together, face to face. What, no, what, what does it mean? There is no community without testimony. There is no meeting encounter. There's no human relation without bearing witness. The witness of humanity is a witness to humanity for the sake of humanity. It's only in the speaking, and sometimes bearing witness entails listening. This is where meaning happens. Meaning is an event. Meaning is a living presence between two. The soul needs meaning as the body needs bread. The soul draws its breath from that between space, from the space in which testimony unfolds, uh, the space in which, as a witness, I declare, Hineni, here I am for you. Um, there, there, there is no humanity, and so it's, it, it's not about me. It's not for my salvation that I engage in, in this testimony. It's, it's for the sake of the other human being who is infinitely precious and who announces to me my infinite responsibility even unto death, even unto a kiddush Hashem, uh, sanctification of the, of the name, which is how in Hebrew we often refer to martyrdom. It's not martyrdom exactly, it's sanctification of the name of the Holy One, of God. For the sake of humanity, for the sake of God. 
where we don't sanctify the infinite dearness of the other human being unto death, God can't find his way into this realm. It's through our saying of Hineni, here I am for you, that God says to us, here I am for you. Unless each single individual is thus infinitely dear, there is no community. It's not about individual versus community or crowd. There is no community unless each single human being, each single child of Adam, as it's known in Hebrew, of Ben Adam, is infinitely dear. That's the only way community takes on meaning, the only way testimony takes on meaning, the only way that the soul draws its breath, for the, not for my sake, but for the sake of the one sitting next to me, the one sitting before me. Thanks so much. Okay, this completes our first part, and you have now a chance to engage each other if you choose to do so. You have lots of mics, so you have every opportunity. You can ask each other questions, uh, make comments. Now they're shy all of a sudden, right? First, they want more than three minutes. Do these, do these mics work? I think it is better if uh, I, we can get some questions that from the audience. Off. That one's off. So we are waiting for some question, if there are some question from audience. Because, yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. Audience is ready, here's yeah. one. Yeah. Do you want a mic? Sure. Yeah. Why don't you give me a mic? Chris, you mind also? Yeah. And we're just. Thank you, sir. So one of the questions uh, is that, uh, you know, all faith preach humanity, equality, and justice. So why do we have so much hate, uh, wars, and discrimination across the world? Any one of you can start the response. All the faiths preach uh, humanity, equality, and justice. So why do we have so much hate, so much uh, discrimination, and wars in the world? Can I say something? See, I don't know why we didn't give you a mic, you know, but here you go. <laughs> um, the answer is very obvious. We have hate, discrimination, not because of religion, because of religious people, okay. because of clergy, because of powerful people who are Actually. using religion for safeguarding their power. So all religions, all philosophical school of thought, they are preaching humanity, morality, and ethical values. Yeah, this is legitimate question. Why we have all this discrimi discrimination? So the cause of discrimination is not school of thoughts, religions, the people. Basically, the clergy. Second, the people. You know that uh, Karl Marx said, religion is a pill of opium. Why? Because he saw very well there are some powerful people who are, you know, um, employing the religious people, clergy, and this is a clergy who is exploiting the sensation of people, the, uh, what you say, that uh, feeling of people, and they are utilizing them as a tool. So the answer is, cause of this discrimination, immorality, unethical behavior is people, not the school of thought, not the religion. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I kind of think about this a lot, this question. Um, and I, I, even today in class, um, I was teaching about kind of maps of, and, and worldviews 
from a thousand years ago from, from that were created and we were looking at world maps and, and these were maps created in, in, the, in, the, in the 10th and 11th century. When you, when you look at these maps and, uh, and even in the Islamic world, they're, they're deriving a lot of their uh, knowledge from the ancient Greek world. And so their, their, to, their geographical view of the world is often uh, directly related to uh, knowledge that they got from Ptolemy, and so it's 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 these n these knowledge traditions. While knowledge traditions, you know, have their value, of course, they also have uh, their limitations or their their uh, their problems, right? And this is what we do as academics: we're we're solving these these age-old problems. Now, when you look at visualizations on these maps, it gets really interesting because as you come to the peripheries of the map, so on this map they have, like, when you get to Central Asia and what would be modern-day Russia, there's this big um, uh, wall there, and that's kind of the legendary wall of Alexander the Great. And um, in, in, in many faith traditions, it's kind of like Alexander the Great built this wall to keep the uh, the the... the the less civilized people out, uh, uh, Gog and Magog, or Yajuj and Majuj in the, in, the, in the Islamic tradition. And when you kind of look at other, like this is how they're seeing geography, right? And you look at other um, uh, schools of thought, and if, if we're gonna talk, talk about it, it's not the schools of thought, but uh, I, I, you, you kind of see that they, when, they, when they're depicting people outside of these peripheries, so the people of Gog and Magog are uncivilized. They're, they're usually with darker skin. Um, and this is something that wasn't just obviously in, in Islamic manuscripts, but it, in, even in the Greek tradition, when you look at the peripheries and, and you come down to like places like Sub-Saharan Africa or the places on the peripheries, that's where you get the creation of monsters and, and hybrids and, and, and just people that are, that are outside of the boundaries of humanity. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's the unknown. It's ignorance, right? Like it's it's kind of seeing something as different. And how do you how do you how do you um, mend that? How do you how do you how do you uh, sort of fix ignorance, right? Uh, if we if we depend on the old taxonomies, the old ways of kind of viewing the world as us, and then everything else is different. I think that's the root of kind of all of these problems that we have. Is that is that like we're, it's always often, often fear of the unknown, um, and fear of the unknown can lead to hate. It can lead to misunderstandings and 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 things like that. So it's it's through education and through sort of breaking down old taxonomies and creating new categories to get beyond and past these ideas. That was my two cents. Uh, that's a big question, and I think the uh, answer is more complicated than I can answer, but uh, I think these are certainly uh, important factors. Uh, just going back to the story of the first uh, witness, we saw that there were two religious men. Both of them were offering gifts to God. Um, one was righteous. God approved of him his, uh, his sacrifice. Uh, the other was a murderer. <laughs> They're both religious. Um, God told one of them, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? Well, he didn't, but why didn't he? Well, that's a, a question for everyone to think through. Um, but stories like this don't give the whole answer, but I think they invite us to ask questions, uh, to ponder them, and get some insights. Uh, and many have done so with this story. I know um, centuries later, uh, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, uh, reflecting on the story said, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice to God than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous when God commended his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Um, which, uh, again, it's great for our theme of uh, witnesses. And they didn't just say something at their time, but they're still speaking. And questions are, who are they speaking to? And what are they saying? What are they bearing witness to? But um, anyway, the point I just want to make from this story, that at least... One of the reasons is not because of what the religions teach. I mean, God, apparently they knew that they should offer something to God. Um, and one did it apparently in a way that approved, uh, got God's approval, another didn't. Um, one commentator said it's because he had faith. The other one had religion only without faith. So uh, 
the question is, it seems to be something inside of the human heart. Um, faith is part of it. I think if, um, do you want to speak to that, or do we want to take some more questions? Some more questions. Some more, okay. Or do you want to? I, I think, did want to, yeah, very you, quickly. Yeah. Um, to whomever posed that question, I would say I don't have the answer. I don't know. I'm not sure that any of us really knows. But what I am sure about is that I have my marching orders. I know what I need to do. I'm not sure that we are called upon to understand evil, which is what was being described, to be able to explain it theologically. I don't think that is required of us. But what is required is to, to take action against it. Thank you. Um, Christy, do you want to read one? Yes. How could one become a green bird? Aha. I think who should answer this question? Ah. Um, well, um, since I was trying to stay within my three minutes, now I, I get a little bit more time to, to answer that question. Um, my idea there of, of, of becoming a green bird is, is, is basically just what you just said, right? Like, it's, it's, it's complicated to try to define um, hate or try to define evil or, or its root causes. Like, we can, we can go around doing it, but actually what, what it's, it's like if there's darkness, the only thing that can get rid of darkness is light. Um, and so when you have this, this idea of, of these green birds carrying the souls of martyrs, the analogy that I'm trying to make there um, and, and, the, and the, the, the liberty that I'm taking there, uh, not to pose a theological sort of interpretation, but more uh, 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 an, 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 an analogy to it is that we all have an obligation to, to honor our predecessors. So often people do it as a, with a memorial or a construction or remembering the past or, and, and you know, people, like I said, 14 million people a year do the pilgrimage to Karbala. But it shouldn't end there. It shouldn't end at that moment. But it's, it's what you do with that action and, and that's how you honor the predecessors. That's how you carry the souls of the martyrs. That's how you honor their sacrifice. And it's, it's, by, it's, by, it's just coming to action in whichever way that you see fit. And so that's why, Dr. Welji, I was, you know, you made us feel uncomfortable because, like, it's it's one thing about bearing witness and and then actually being a witness. And I think that that was a super. Uh, uh, it was a very powerful point that you made earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. A uh, question is, why do we? have to be a believer. Is there any specific definition, criteria for all these faith groups? I know about mine, but some take away from this session. Do you have a kind of 12, 14 steps of something that this is a believer, <laughs> something? That's an excellent question. Does this work? Why do you have to be a believer? That's an excellent question. I love what Ali just said about uh, the accent on action. Uh, Beverly, I love what you said. Uh, we don't understand evil. Theology is a luxury that we don't have a, the luxury to indulge in. It's a question. To know God is to know what must be done. God doesn't ask Cain. How do you feel? What do you believe? What do you understand? He asked them, where's your brother and what have you done? Because that's how we say where our brother is. Um, I, I can tell you that in Judaism, the, the, the determination of righteousness doesn't go to belief. That you can be an atheist and be righteous. It's, it goes to, when we speak of the righteous among the nations, we're not talking about what they believe or don't believe. We're talking about how they treat other people. That's what is needful. And, uh, you know, when the Israelites were asked uh, at Mount Sinai if they would accept the Torah that's revealed to them, if they would live by it, they answered, Na'aseva Nishma, which is, we will do it, and then we'll hear it, we'll understand it, we'll believe it, whatever. But the, 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 the urgency of feeding a hungry person 
transcends the requirement of believing anything. Whether you believe it or not, you got to feed some the hungry. Whatever you believe, the secondary. At least that's how Judaism sees it. David, we'll take again one from the left side. Well, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, where is your thing? What does it mean when you are saying that uh, what is believe and what is believer? Believer means reflection of your apprehension about the reality. Bring it, uh, bring it closer to you. Close. No, it's okay. So, see, if you are not a believer, again you are a believer. If you are not believing something, again this is a kind of belief. What does it mean when I'm saying I'm a believer, I believe in something, actually believe is a reflection of my apprehension about the reality, your world view, your wealth and shock. So everyone has some wealth and chunk, but when we are using the word believe, we are understanding uh, in the context of a religion. So this is not a good thing. Everyone, every human being has a concept of reality. Maybe it is not according to the reality, maybe it is not genuine, but everyone has some world view. So whatever world view do you have, and if you are believing that this is world view, so this is your belief. And your acts, your action, your morality, your social values, your moral values, actually all these are reflection of your belief system. You, you are a believer, maybe you are accepting or not. Thank you. The, thank you. The next question, uh, which uh, I ponder quite often, because I have seen so many of uh, such seminars, such efforts, uh, whether collectively or individual level, take place. So the question always arises, can a grassroots effort such as this bring any change towards uh, moving towards more human, more just system? Can something like this, a small gathering, actually be the beginning of a change? Yes. Right? I hope everyone wants to answer this one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Asif. Uh, that's a very challenging question. Um, and it, it uh, reminds me of the starfish story, which a lot of you would have heard. A young man was there throwing starfish back as they were drying out on the sand. And a mature man comes to him and says, son, what difference is it going to make? There are thousands of starfish on the beach here, and you throw one, what difference will it make? The young man looks at him, picks up another starfish, throws it back into the water, and said it made a difference to that one. So it could be a small group, it could be a large group, Asif. It's a passion of the people who come together, who have a vision like Beverly has, for example, that here is a problem that needs a solution. And there is a beautiful couplet in Urdu, which I will not repeat in Urdu, but simply translated says that I started walking alone towards the destination people started joining and a caravan began. And truly this is something that a passion, when independence movements were started, they were started by those who had a vision, just one, two, three people, and then the entire nation joined in. So that's basically, uh, yes, as if a small group sitting here today, will probably see the establishment of the Karbala Center for Humanity in the next 20 years to say that here was a center that was established to memorialize, to remember, to witness the witnesses who have done so much for humanity. As a Danish philosopher says, 
that life must be lived forward, but it must be understood backwards. And this is indeed what these institutions can do for us. And we have to cuddle our loins to say, yes, we can do it. Thank you. It's in the, sorry, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that we get to as many of the questions. So, Christy? How do the panelists propose that we move from passive witnessing to active witnessing? Ha. Who is the lucky one who answers this one? I think actually David would like to answer how, this uh, one, right? Yes. Uh, how do you go from passive to active? How do you impart flesh to the word? Uh, it begins with, with the word, with words, with words of loving kindness. With, uh, it begins with having time for someone else. The only time we have is the time that we have for another. Otherwise, we mark time, waste time, do time, and otherwise... Uh, you know, obliterate time. We lose the time of our lives. So we have the time that we offer, that we give. Uh, and the acting, the imparting uh, action to the words is about giving. Giving your time, giving a helping hand. Uh, willing to be inconvenienced. It's very small. Listening. Acting begins with listening. Um... Being attentive to, uh, to the outcry that's, out, that's coming to us from the other person. Asking the other person about his, her well-being, health, family. Just It starts in small ways. And then that will lead to, is there anything I can do for you? If you're working on something, let me help you with it. I'll even help you move, which is a big pain, right? <laughs> I'd rather watch the game, but... But that's, it's, it's, it starts small, and our every word, our every deed creates an angel for good or for ill. Then the angels go out into the world and do their work. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Very short. If you want to change something, particularly the human society, you need two things. Sense of realization and then courage to express your feeling. And Imam Hussain al-Islam gave us this thing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take another. Ah, Christy. How do you plan to make this center a true interfaith, inter-Muslim establishment instead of just a Shia Muslim center? You want to answer this one? Absolutely. So I want to... Uh, uh, whoever asked the question probably didn't get the message uh, that I s spoke about at the at the start of this. This humanity and uh, is or effort towards humanity or center of humanity is not a Muslim cause in any way. It transcends all the colors, creeds, religions, regions, and everyone else. So if someone has this uh, mindset that it is only Muslim, uh, I would probably uh, argue very humbly against that. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple of these. Uh, one asks how we can work together to prevent the excess death of girls and women. And the other sort of expands upon that and says, uh, why women? If religions pe preach equality, preach love and care, are those same religions encouraging the harm of women or suppressing them? Why do many deem a woman as weaker or as less important than a man? Thank you to whomever asked that. I'll take the questions in reverse order. I think most religious scholars would agree that the denigration of women and the subordination of women and the oppression of women comes from a misreading and a misunderstanding of the sacred texts. Uh, several years ago, um, uh, Mr. Effendi hosted an uh, interfaith conference on this subject, and we had faith scholars uh, from of every stripe, and it was agreed that the sacred texts um, 
honor the dignity of women and the equality of women. And it is a, you know, culture and misunderstanding that leads to the disparagement and subordination of women. Uh, regarding the other point, how do we discourage the, um, how do we stop excess female death? Uh, you know, there are many ways to do this. Ultimately, it, it, all of this behavior proceeds from the belief that female life is of less value than male life. And that needs to be contested. And probably the best way to do that is through education, uh, both of men and of women. Uh, women need to understand their in inherent value. Men need to understand that, too. Uh, and the education can take all forms. It, it, um, there are basically two types. Um, there's one about, uh, if, if you look at history, if you look at contemporary politics, you see women as actors, you see how vital they are in the world. Um, that's one form of education. Um, there's probably nothing more compelling than having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone whom you see as lesser to convince you that that person is not. Uh, then the, there's the practical education. If women are educated to be financially self-sufficient, not dependent on a male, uh, if they come to be seen as economic assets rather than economic burdens, their, um, their value in the society uh, is elevated. Uh, and they also come to understand that they have rights, that perhaps their society does not defend and protect those rights, but nevertheless, they have them. Um, those rights are better protected elsewhere in the world. They develop, they develop a sense of what's possible and become equipped to fight for their rights. Sorry, I'm just so passionate about the work that you do. And, and, and we, you mentioned education, and, and of course, um, educating women on the same uh, level as you would educate uh, young men and young women together equally, that's, that's, that's obviously the first step. Um, but also economic equality, you know, um, and, and this, we're living in a country where there's actual laws set up here where women can do the same work as men and be discriminated and paid less. So it's, 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 it's also creating that space, not only in the world of education, but in the, wor the world of, of, of the economy. So it's, 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 it's encouraging everyone from whichever, like, how, how would you take action? you know, hire women um, and, and pay women more and, and understand that women also have more roles that they fulfill in society and, and understand those roles as well. And so um, I, think, I think also, um, uh, you know, raising the bar a little bit to the economic equality of women uh, around the world is, is, is a first step as well because you can do a lot with education but if the, if the, if the, the job field is, is not equal for men and women and this is obviously, we're, we're much better off here than in other places but it's encouraging other countries to, to create spaces for women that are, um, uh, that, that are equal to, to uh, in, especially in economic levels of, 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 of their male counterparts. Um. Again, this is a passion uh, that I do have. Um, you know, a lot of times we talk the talk in terms of women empowerment. We do not walk the walk most of the time. And it's much more so, some of you may not be familiar, some of you may be, that in certain developing countries, the gap is huge. But today what technology has offered us, and there's an example, this is not to pitch any particular project because I'm involved in it, but as an example of what can be done is in order to close the technology, the gender gap in technology in Pakistan, we launched a small project with just 50 girls who had brought in from lower middle class families to be trained into IT boot camps. The result is in three years time, we have brought over a thousand girls 
out of whom nearly 250 are gainly, gainfully employed, well employed within the Pakistani IT industry at a good level. What that has done is not only, as you said, economic empowerment, but as an example, what that has done is completely change the family dynamics. Now you have a woman bringing in 250 $300 into a home whose total income is $500, makes a huge difference in the self-esteem, in the way that women are viewed in that society, and you're able to move on. These are the kind of things that need to be done at every level. So we need to really walk the walk when we talk about women empowerment and not just talk the talk. Thank you. The, the next question, uh, which um, is again based on a lot of uh, uh, evil events, if I can say that. Uh, you mentioned George Floyd ev uh, event earlier. Uh, but if you look at history, uh, there seems to be someone uh, becoming a witness, a martyr, or a bad thing happened for any change to take place. Why does that happen? Why does a bad thing have to happen before a change has to take place? <laughs> Do you want to? I said, why does anything have to happen? I think President Obama said it best. He said that this world has an EDD, -D, Empathy Deficit Disorder. <laughs> and truly, bad things happen because there is a deficit of empathy amongst human beings. The sky doesn't do bad things to us. The trees don't do bad things to us. We do bad things to each other. And if there was a level of empathy and understanding between two human beings, then bad things either don't happen or if they do happen, they are corrected. And this is the crux of it. We really sometimes are looking at universal problems in a global way rather than coming down to earth and saying, what is the core of this particular problem? Many a time, says I'll end on this note, because I love Rumi as a poet. And Rumi said that many a times you have a bottle of perfume. You're looking at this beautiful bottle of perfume. You are admiring it. You are showing it off and doing whatever. But unless you open the bottle of that perfume, you open the cap, you will never understand the essence of that perfume. Same thing with problems. We need to go deep into it. It boils down, it boils down to the human psyche. And the, I believe it is a lack of empathy. And coming back to an earlier question which I wanted to address was, in terms of faith and belief, because it is connected, is that there are two principles, which have no faith, which have no color. One is a golden rule, do unto others what you would like done to them. And the other one is the appreciation of the greater good. If we were to follow that particular moral compass on those two things, then bad things may not happen. This may be um, a dream, this may be you know, living in the clouds, but truly, Asif, this is the reality between human beings. Human beings do bad things to each other. If there is empathy between two human beings, they will not do bad things to each other. Thank you. Karl Marx and his followers wrote and promised a better society, but the praxis was different. My question is to the Islamic scholars. The praxis of Islam is not that good around the world. Do you think something is wrong with the book or with the praxis? I think this is an illogical question because uh, the man or the person who raised this question, there are some you know, logical uh, fallacies in the question. So he, he or she has something in his mind and uh, then he or she is 
you know, uh, trying to reach the conclusion before uh, some debates. Practice is not guaranteeing the result. This is your intention. This is your awareness. This is your, uh, you know, enlightenment. So if you are doing some practices without the knowledge, without the passion, without your true and genuine wealth and shank, then this was only the holy, the, uh, what you say that, uh, the only, the cover of practices. Unfortunately, in Muslim world, majority of the people, they are doing all these things. We are going to perform the Hajj. What is the essence and what is the spirit of Hajj? To get the equality. But you know, we now have five-star Hajj. We have three-star Hajj. So we have class classification of the society. All these things, you know, what is the uh, one of the uh, practice of uh, Islam? Prayer. What is the gist of prayer? Meditation. Are we doing some meditation during our prayer? No, we're not doing. So actually all these practices are without the spirit. Spiritless practices are only the practices and then the people will say the practices are the main cause of this hypocrisy. Actually, cause of this dual, uh, you know, uh, this hypocrisy is something unawareness, ignorance. Thank you. Thank you. I think we want to have one more question from you. Sure. It seems like a business-oriented question, but let's ask anyways. Uh, we have seen a lot of businesses, especially in the United States, having a lot of uh, charitable uh, efforts, contributions, and uh, uh, encouragement to be part of uh, different uh, uh, volunteer groups. Uh, the question really is more like, uh, do such practices really enable business or are good for business, or is it just a waste of time? Dr. Persson, you seem like... You know a lot about charitable contributions. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very charitable man. So I, that's I'm very, I yeah, I'm charitable. I'm sitting, I'm not being, we're not being paid, or at least I'm not tonight. <laughs> So this is my donation. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, 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 I, don't, I don't know anything about business, which is why I'm a professor. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do, uh, and I'm a terrible fundraiser. We have a very uh, highly skilled professional fundraiser in Holly Miori here with us. But I do, I, I have been in, in meetings with donors. I have been asked to say something to donors before. And uh, one thing that I try to get across to, to a, someone who, who, has, who wants to give, many donors want to give something, but they want to have a sense of what's at stake. Why does it matter? If you're donating to higher learning, What's higher about higher learning? If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, bring uh, sacred traditions together, what's sacred about them? What is, what's at stake? What's, what's, what lives or dies? And ultimately, anything worth giving to is a matter of life and death, whether we realize that right away or not. This is a matter of life and death, what we're doing here. It's, attesting to the dearness of life is a matter of life and death. Um, and it's, it can be dangerous. Because uh, th there was a question about why does it require blood to bring about a change? Why does somebody have to die? President Lyndon Johnson supposedly once said to Martin Luther King, I need more blood. It Maybe it's apocryphal, but you get the point. To be a witness to the point of martyrdom entails shaking people from their sleep. 
and we cherish nothing more than our sleep. We will kill people who, sh who wake us up. We will. We do. It, it, we, we get shaken not only from the sleep of our complacency, but the sleep of our self-righteousness, the illusion of, of knowing the answers fixed. Nothing is more deadly than, to the truth than fixed formulas and ready answers, than assurances. We all want to be assured. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm cool. I'm good. I'm righteous. Whatever the assurance might be. But the, the martyr yanks that ground out from under our feet. And now we, now we have to say, again, as I said earlier, here I am for you. And we have to ask. We have to be able, we have to have the courage of the question. So, um, I mean, people who donate to something like this, I think they, they want to. Uh, they want to be part of uh, addressing a question part of being part of the testimony. Uh, it's, uh, have their humanity, you know, invested in it. I'm sorry, we're just about running out of time. Thank you, David. But uh, we wanted to conclude with a reading of poems, and so we want to make sure that we have time for this. Thank and you very much. We're at that point now, right? Yes, sir, we are. Uh, let me invite uh, on and uh, Mr. Uh, Zafar to please uh, present uh, the Noha. And uh, Zafar Bhai, the flag is on the back. Thank you so much. I would like to extend my utmost gratitude to the organizers and esteemed speakers and respectable audience here for giving me this opportunity. Uh, before I finally present in front of you guys the, the noho or the eulogy, I would like to give you a brief introduction about what actually it says, because it's in Urdu. <clears throat> this eulogy is originally composed by one of the finest and well-renowned um, noha khans and noha reciters of Pakistan, Sayyid Ali Muhammad Rizvi, famously known as Sachabai. <clears throat> Uh, the central idea of this theology or the Noha depicts that every tyrannical regime um, tries its very best to control the narrative of events for their own interest. Um, but like Abbas, who was the flag bearer of Hossein's army during the Battle of Karbala, stood against tyranny and oppression, we vow to, stood against, to stand against oppression and tyranny until the existence of this world. <clears throat> this flag actually represents um, that Hussein was the first witness of humanity who stood against oppression and made a stand for humanity for the prevalence of justice, equality, and truth. So um, I would just like to present this noha in front of you guys. And here it goes. <clears throat> Chhod hai apna lo, chhod hai apna lo, jab tak hai dore. सुन ले ये हर पीरो जवा आवाज पर शाबिर की बढ़ता रहे ये कारवारुकने ना पाए ये कदम कब तक न मानेगा कोई वो वक्त आएगा कभी 
हर कल्ब पर जाएगा अपना हुसैन बने अली इस दर पे हर सर होगा खम ऊँचा रहे अपना ऊँचा रहे अपना जब कर बलायाद आएगी इंसानियत शर्माएगी मजलूम की आवाज है दिल में उतरती जाएगी पलटेंगे फिर बह के कदम ऊँचा रहे अपना ऊँचा रहे अपना जिंदा ये बेदारी रहे ये सिलसिला जारी रहे हम हो न हो इस बजम में कायम आजादारी रहे निकले इसी चौखट पे दम ऊँचा रहे अपना ऊँचा रहे अपना Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This unfortunately brings our wonderful evening now to a conclusion. Thank you again to all our distinguished speakers. Thank you all for being here and thank you for everyone else who was apparently following us from their homes um, on various screens. Good evening to you all. <laughs>